G'day, welcome to Mark and Sam After Work. Um, today I want to touch on a um, question, a comment that um, we get reasonably frequently for all different, re different reasons and that's Coriolis. Um, in different levels, from people who don't believe that it exists, who people don't believe we're in a sphere um, of, of the planet Earth, to people that don't believe that um, it causes um, any issues to people who wonder how you can possibly deal with it because it causes monstrous issues. Um, so I want to go through that step by step in as much as I can, try and break it down without getting too complicated. Um, first off, for the people who are not clear that we're on a sphere that's rotating in the middle of space. Um, listen, there's, uh, what can I say to go with that? The, 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 my simple um, conversation is probably twofold. There's lots of obvious things that's easy and, and apparent for us to observe. Um, there is more complex questions as to how on earth can you not be on a sphere to have different time zones and right now I can ring up on the other side of the world to someone who's standing in the middle of night um, at a completely different time zone to me. There's a very logical solution. I can tell you why that exists. My bigger question is why some people feel that it is someone else's responsibility to prove stuff to them. Um, but that's all I'll say on that. I'll move forward. We're on a rotating sphere. Um, the next level of it would be the um, logic of that how can that affect things. If you're standing one place on the earth and you shoot something to another place on the earth, we're all on the same earth, it's all relatively flat, why would it make a difference? Um, and to that I'd say there is simple mathematics that's involved with this. Um, in a very simple way of breaking it down, the understanding that if you come to any section or, or if you put it into 2D and understand the principle that in a rotating circle, rotating at one revolution per unit um, at any given height from that circle you're going to create a different speed of actual movement this speed versus this speed if they are spinning at one unit one rotation per 24 hours you're going to get a different speed at different heights if you understand that in, in principle and then both from something traveling up in an arc and back down again with a varying speed across its arc, um, you're going to end up with a different point of, of recontacting its original, its original circumference. And you've also got the fact that on a rotating sphere, that means that this part of it is traveling at a different speed than the, po the poles are traveling at a different sp speed to the equator. You put all that in and you find that mathematically it's quite simple to see that there's going to be a different um, exit and re-entry um, in the way of how things change from one sphere to another sphere and it's not about the complexities of the fact that it's the globe rotating in the middle of space that's causing the problem. It's simple mathematics of around a, of a, of a rotating sphere. So the next level of it, which I'd go into, is the, the um, which people, um, well, I suppose there's a couple of different directions I'd go with. One is the um, randomness of it, that it's going to keep affecting things. Um, no, that's not the case. Um, this, is a very, this is a complete constant. It is a constant thing that happens all the time. It is mathematical, and it means that once it's always going to affect the bullet in exactly the same way. Um, so, or anything, whatever it is, in exactly the same way. It's always going to do precisely the same thing. So once you've actually, if you're shooting in a particular direction, it's once you've adjusted for it, it's going to do the same thing. It doesn't keep adjusting, it doesn't, it's not random, it's not weird in the way it does things. Once you've adjusted for it, it becomes a straight line again. There's nothing involved. It just goes to exactly where you're talking about. The other bit that I wanted to say with this side of things is the, and the more simple way to look at this, if you take maths out of the equation, if you take um, um, what actually happens out of the equation, if you want to go into, is it to do with gravity or two, all those things, if you want to take all that out of the equation, there's a far simpler way to look at it in my, in, from my way of looking at things, is that 
This wasn't come up. This was not come up with. With we have this maths problem to solve um, as to how to do this to be able to shoot a long way. This was come up with. Coriolis was something that came into our world in a different fashion. This actually came about from my reading and my understanding of it. This came about when it got to the point in the military when artillery was able to fire pretty much past where they could see. So they were shooting beyond the horizon. So they weren't shooting little shots like three miles or five miles or six miles or eight miles. It was starting to move into where they're shooting in the 10 miles, in the 15 miles, in the 20 miles, in the 25 mile shots. So they'd got to the point where they had done a huge amount of development in the, in the um, artillery side of things when they were able to fire things out barrels. Uh, not talking about missiles, different conversation. This is talking about artillery. This is talking about something that would fire something out of barrels. So basically a giant rifle. Rifling, great big long barrel, gunpowder, firing a, a projectile so whether it was explosive or not, but it was not directed, it was something that was able to fire out the end. And then to get it to go to a certain place, it needed spin stabilization, it needed to be aimed properly, it needed to be able to, they were, they had, were on to understanding about spin drift, they were on to understanding about how wind affects projectiles, they were on to all these things and working it out properly. They had got to a stage where they were able to aim very precisely and it kept going to the wrong place. At that stage, they had brought into the fact that, wait a minute, there's a piece of physics or a piece of mass that we're not bringing to this equation. And then by bringing that mass into the equation, they could get to where they could aim 20 miles away and be Obviously, we're talking artillery and explosives, so we're talking something that is trying to blow up 100 square meters. So they're not trying to pinpoint it down to the square into an MOA group. Um, they are trying to come down, well, I suppose they are going with the MOA group, but they're not trying to hit something smaller than a house, but they are still trying to get to that place, and that's where the maths comes from. Now, how accurately, I don't know. I don't know the research on what they actually got to, but that's where it comes from, extremely long range shooting. I touched on the fact they're not missiles, and one of the things that some of the conversations I've seen is people um, talking in the military where they would fire off missiles and they would just give it the coordinates, they'd go there, so that proves that Coriolis doesn't exist. No, a missile's nothing to do with this. If you have something that is directing itself to a coordinate, where it'll change its flight as it travels, that is a completely different creature. It does have a GPS, a set of coordinates to go to, so it'll direct itself. We are 100% talking about something that has no direction from other than where the barrel's pointing. So, all that being said, largely, you can ignore Coriolis. Yes, I believe it does exist. Have I ever been able to prove it out of shooting? No, I've not. I use it and I try and use it in, and I'll go into that in a little bit of detail in a second. But the truth is that conditions, be it um, well, basically air is the largest thing we're dealing with, has a lot more control over your bullet than you realise. Or maybe than you realise, but a lot more control over the bullet. It has a lot bigger chance of moving the bullet the stuff you can't read in the air, there's a lot bigger chance of moving the bullet to the left or the right or high or low than Coriolis has in the way of it's, it's, Coriolis is going to do it, but it's going to move it by one or two or three MOA at the absolute, sorry, well, not by MOA, by essentially you might be dialing in. Um, in Coriolis, the biggest stuff we're generally moving would be as much as one and a half, maybe two MOA of actual adjustment, where we will, in the same shot, be dealing with um, an air pressure change, which we are not able to read, can move it by more than that. A wind, uh, one of the things that people don't understand about wind, if you shoot just long range, then wind at six o'clock or wind at 12 o'clock doesn't make that much difference, because your bullets 
if it has to travel a little bit further, or a little bit, um, or a, a little bit, essentially, if it's fighting 20 miles an hour wind coming into it, that's only going to drop the shot by uh, at, at, at 900 yards. That's only going to drop the shot by less than half MOA because the bullet is coming in fairly flat. When you go ELR and the bullet is coming in like this and it's been dealing with 20 miles an hour of wind, all of a sudden that shot is potentially going to drop two to three to four meters short. So wind, just the wind direction, especially and the high level wind, can change a shot monstrously. Obviously left and right, 30 MOA, 20 MOA, 30 MOA, 40 MOA, quite, quite likely if you're dealing with winds that are moving left or right. So from your three o'clock to your nine o'clock. Where your dialing for Coriolis was 1.9, 1, 1 1.5 MOA left and right. How can you tell the difference when you can't see the wind? So what I'd say, that the way I use it, well, there's two things that I'm trying to say there. One is to fuss about it is only relevant for your first shot. Once you've seen an impact, then you're adjusting to your impact. So you adjust to your wind. If you can see your wind, then you adjust. You're going to go to the wind as well as where your impact was. But largely in ELI, you're adjusting to your impact. Um, if you and, and you'll see changes you can't explain. None of them are going to be anything changing in Coriolis or Spindrift. Those two things are going to stay very much the same. They're consistent things. So you adjust to your impacts. Um, with the likes of where I do use Coriolis and I and I try and factor it in is I in twofold in trying to get a one shot hit or trying to get as close as I can straight away. Then I try and factor it in. Does it make a difference? To be truthful, it's more luck involved in ELR. There's more luck that I read that wind right. It's more luck that, that the conditions were as I presumed them to be through that shot. Um, in, in you're generally going through three or four or five or six different wind streams and you're trying to make an average of those wind streams. So as for the Coriolis side of things, I still try and factor it in. I still try and make sure my spin drift is accurate as possible, all that sort of stuff. But as said, it's really more about those conditions. The other place and the place that I mainly use it is in trying to factor in the data. If I was shooting east-west or if I was shooting west-east or wherever I was shooting, once I get that data, which is how I try and get my first shots, how I try and get so close all the time is recording my data all the time, is that that one or two MOA involved in that shot, I look at what it actually took at the end of the day and the average shots I was taking and try and make sense of what all those conditions tell me and then I try and factor that in. So I put my raw data down the bottom of my sheet so I'm looking at my raw data. That's where I'm factoring it in. Does it really mean anything and can I prove anything? No I can't. Um, I've not seen conditions which I could shoot in any particular direction that I could guarantee the wind was doing something. Now maybe in the middle of a big flat desert with exactly the same wind, I could go out and prove it. I've never seen those conditions. I don't have that big flat desert close to me. Um, and, and even the, the flatter stuff I have had, it, the, the conditions change from one moment to the next. There'll be subtle changes in the shot I've got in front of me that I'm trying to read. So to spin around and shoot the other direction, I'm not going to be able to prove it. I do believe it exists, but I do believe it there, the maths of it. But I'll come back to, is it worth bothering? Even in my 5K shot, is it worth worrying about? No, it's not. No, it's not. Like I said, record the data, but to worry about it, to think it's going to make you miss your shot, all that sort of stuff, no. You know, the, the weather, the conditions are far more relevant. Um, to the flat earthers that don't want to believe the world's going on, like I said, my bigger point, apart from what's obvious out there, is... Um, I don't see why it's anyone else's responsibility to point out what's obvious to the rest of us. Anyway, um, hope that was um, worth something. Coriolis, yes, I believe it's a real thing. Don't let it stress you. Don't worry about it. It's not something to get um, concerned about at all. Um, and go out there and, and, and shoot, record your data. Okay, guys, thanks for catching, catching up with us, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching the video guys, I hope you enjoyed. 
Uh, down below here we've got a link to our web store where we have some of the specialised long range shooting products that we actually produce. Check them out. And for those of you who can, it'd be great to get some help. In our store we have support bits and when you purchase those the money goes direct to our channel and helps us bring these videos to you. Thanks guys. See you next time.